Hello, welcome to my short story channel. I've had it in mind for a little while now to set up a channel on YouTube reading my short stories. I've written 12 um, and I intend to read one each month and uh, we'll see how it goes. It's something of an experiment. I've got one subscriber, which is me. So at the very least, I will have one like, um, which is a comfort to me. Anyway, here is the very first one. It's called The Right Seat. The Right Seat. Nothing would ruin Henry's mood today. Not even the unpleasantness over the seat on the train this morning. That had been partially his fault now that he considered it. But really, it was just a seat. He felt justified in the stance he had taken. Perhaps he would have curtailed one or two of the more choice epithets he had levelled at the man, but taking it all in all, he deserved them. What's in a seat, anyway? It is not as if some on a British rail train are plusher than others. They're all rather hard, upright, unyielding, bristle-backed chairs, which are made with utility and hard-wearing durability in mind, rather than that of the gentle-bottomed passenger's comfort. Anyway, today would be a good day, in spite of all that business. Today is, in fact, the day. It is a day he has been planning for for some time. This is what he has been working towards assiduously for the past few weeks. Just a job interview in the city to some people, perhaps. But such people would probably say Mozart wrote music without lyrics. Sort of karaoke for the snooty. After four years in this god-awful dead-end job, he had at last found one which suits him to a T. He's perfectly qualified for it this time. It isn't one of those creative applications where he had had to make his CV become so inventive he might have had more success entering it for a literary prize. He had spent a week on his application alone, and when he was invited to interview by the senior partner, George Templeman, he knew knew the job was his for the asking. But Henry was leaving nothing to chance. For four nights now he had rehearsed the answer to every question he could conceivably be asked. On the train and the tube into King's Cross each morning he had thought of nothing else. He knew everything about the company, about its goals, its core and ethical values, the what, the who, the why and its mission statement was etched into his brain. He had studied George Templeman's career, his background even. He planned to draw on this to impress him. He sat in his seat rehearsing every conceivable angle. What could he bring to the role? What had he to offer the company? He gave a careful recitation in his mind of his credentials, his qualifications, his experience, the way in which he would contribute to the future of the company. Well, apart from this morning, that is, when that self-righteous twerp had demanded he vacate his seat for him, because he had, he said, reserved it. As if to prove the matter, he had thrust a reservation ticket in Henry's face. It would have been fine if there had been no other seats, but this early on in the journey there were plenty of seats to be had. Well, on reflection it had been something else that had got Henry's goat. He looked at the man, supercilious, that was the word, and small, weaselly, protective of his rights, a finicky sort of man who would notice if someone had borrowed a paperclip, a man who, if you asked to borrow a pen, would ask for it back ten minutes later. If it was a rubber, he would withdraw it unwillingly from a secure part of his desk which he locked carefully each night and handed to you slowly, so that you were in no doubt that it was a grievous fault of yours not to have one of your own, and owed something to a personal defect on your part that you did not take proper care of such invaluable office utensils. He would await its return deliberately, tapping a silent foot, watching you use the rubber, a quiet disdain, as if he was on the verge of telling you how a rubber eraser should be properly used. And then he would retrieve his rubber from you, fastidiously, 
return it to his desk and bury it deep in the recesses of some drawer, and he would pointedly lock it when he went out at lunchtime. Henry knew such men, and he bridled at this one, demanding his seat, simply because it was his right, though there were an abundance of alternatives in the carriage, all equally splendid and replete with hard, bum-numbing, bristle-backed seats. He told him so. The man looked confounded at this disturber of the universe, the colour in his cheeks heightened markedly. Henry wanted to laugh. Then the man quickly recovered. He was being challenged by this usurper of rubbers and pens and seats which did not rightfully belong to him. His nostrils were pinched. Spectacles were perched indignantly on his high-bridged nose. A permanent downturned mouth from years of complaining about something or other, now competing with past occasions and winning. I'm afraid I have booked this seat he said, with polite acidity in his voice, seeking to restore to the universe the equilibrium that was its due. Yes, rejoined Henry insolently, his face blank with deliberate offence. He widened his legs in blatant manspreading ownership of the seat. Aren't there any other seats available? He looked around. The Weasley man didn't. I booked this one. Number 44, see, said the man, urgently, showing him his reservation ticket again. By a considerable exertion of willpower, Henry resisted the temptation he was experiencing to take the ticket from the man and gobble it up before his eyes, with a, what about that, look. This possible solution, amusing though Henry thought it undoubtedly was, thus lost its opportunity in the order of things, surviving only as a faint contemptuous curl of his lip. The man compressed his lips in silent fury, looking severely upon this interloper. Now ordinarily Henry would have yielded his seat to this man, but there was something about this neat little man that irked him. It made him act badly, brought out the worst in him. He looked about the carriage in leisurely fashion, showing not the least sign of moving. There's a seat over there, too back, he said casually, nodding at a seat which was empty, and beside which a red-faced man sat studiously reading his newspaper, apparently oblivious to the contretemps. Yes, but you see I have reserved this one, insisted the man, with patient perseverance to his cause, pointing to his ticket again, whose proof Henry continued to steadfastly ignore. None of the others big enough for your fat butt, he queried. The man reddened considerably. He had got to him, and Henry didn't care. The man, like all such little men, considered he had right on his side, and he knew it. There had always been something of the schoolyard bully about Henry, however hard he had tried to cure himself of it. This man reminded him a lot of Mr. Pleasance, his physics teacher at school. He was a finicky little man, too. Didn't see the funny side of a drawing pin on his seat, or overhearing Henry calling him Pinhead behind his back loudly. He disliked Henry, looked at him the way this Weasley man was looking at him now. Henry had made Mr. Pleasance's life a daily nightmare. Pinhead Pleasance got his revenge by marking Henry's work wrong, even when it was right. The world is full of Mr. Pleasancers, Henry considered. They have consistently blocked his career thus far, just for the hell of it. Henry was, it is fair to say, liberally and constitutionally disinclined to oblige the little man before him by giving up his seat. It was a blow to all Mr. Pleasancers in this world. I shall call a ticket inspector if you wish, the man threatened him with as cool an effort as he could muster, but was, nevertheless, plainly furious. It had the effect on Henry of making him cooler still, slouching like a schoolboy in easy defiance. "'Take that seat there,' nodded Henry, again directing his gaze towards the vacant seat whose immediate neighbour was studying his newspaper so steadfastly 
refusing to be a party to this debacle in the carriage. Everyone else seemed to have become deaf and looked out of the window vaguely or consulted diaries or laptops or phones for distraction. Listen, said the man, who coveted rubbers like they were the tablets of Sinai, who found the sharing of pens unwelcome and insanitary as a general practice, and who locked the drawers of his desk and checked their secureness, having done so each evening before he left the office. I paid to reserve this seat, number 44, not number 43 or 45 or any other number. I have reserved this seat, this one. If you wish to sit in that seat there, he turned towards the vacant seat, which had become a place of peril, a seat which no one would touch, and whose very existence the red-faced man beside it was furiously denying, bitterly regretting selecting his present seat, its neighbour, and wishing fervently he was not the subject of association with this seat, which was one of abject humiliation. Please feel free to sit there. Henry looked up at the man. He nodded, as if in confirmation of some fact he had been testing in his mind. Oh, you are a right miserable git, aren't you? he asked, rhetorically, and seeing the ticket inspector entering the carriage at the far end, he stood up slowly, clearly under protest, and paused in front of the man, prodding him in the chest with an aggressive forefinger. You are a prat. You know that? he inquired again, quite rhetorically. Then Henry, in what he regarded as the coup de grace, extended his hand towards the disputed seat, with deliberate grandiloquence in his manner. Take a seat, he said, with exaggerated, unnecessary courtesy. The Weasley man with the pinched nose and quivering nostrils and indignant spectacles perched high on his bony nose sat down to the seat he had most assuredly reserved by phone the previous evening for the sum of one pound, and which was his by right. The inalienable right of every Englishman, Weasley or not, who had respect for the order of the universe and the civility of human society had been asserted. Henry moved back two rows and sat heavily down in the seat which had become something of a naughty seat in the compartment, a seat of ignominy. If someone had placed a toilet seat in the carriage, you'd no more think of sitting on it. Henry had felt in some strange way fortified, invigorated by the episode, mildly triumphant, he had then sought to put the matter out of his mind. Now that he thought of it, it was a silly thing to have done, a fuss over nothing. He had been in such a mood, and it really wasn't worth the disturbance he had caused to the equilibrium of his own mind, let alone that of the universe, to create such a fuss. Today, in particular, he comforted himself with the reflection that the Weasley man had probably had a much worse day, and that made him smile. He could almost sense Mr. Pleasance having a bad day somewhere too, wherever it was that rubber-retentive, pen-coveting, waistcoat-wearing physics teachers were consigned after the rest of the world was tired of them. Hell, probably. Henry had mostly succeeded in putting the matter from his mind by lunchtime. It was all but forgotten. He focused on going through some of the questions he needed to be on point for, he left the office early, and got across town in good time by tube and a five-minute walk, so that he made his destination early. He was leaving nothing to chance today. He walked about a little to quieten his nerves before the interview, took some deep breaths. Some last-minute pre-flight checks were done. Remember, enter the room, a smile leaving the face, stand tall, Extend a hand positively first, and look the man in the eye. Right. He walked through the doors in the building in New Cavendish Street and into reception at 2.20 p.m. He walked pleasantly and authoritatively, a brief rehearsal of his smile on his face, diminishing as he approached the girl at reception. I have an interview with Mr. Templeman at 2.30.
he told her. She smiled at Henry. What name is it? she asked. Henry Squires, he told her. Please take a seat, Mr. Squires, she said. He selected and sat at a steel and chrome framed chair with a hard cushioned back to it, a certain spring to its back, which gave a pleasant sensation. Nothing at all like the unyielding British rail seats. These were seats made for comfort, ergonomic in design, for the comfort and relaxation of visitors while not diminishing their alertness. He approved. No one challenged his right to this seat. It was reserved for him. Henry crossed his legs and observed the creases in the front of his trousers with satisfaction. He had creased them with an iron the night before and left them pressed overnight, a rare attention to detail for him. He had put them on only at the last possible moment before leaving the flat that morning. The creases had survived the morning well. He was leaving nothing to chance. The receptionist, who had disappeared into the sanctum of Mr. Templeman, behind the forbidding heavy door, now reappeared, a polished smile upon her face. She had a nice bobbed hairstyle, and a smooth skirt of black and white check, a high-necked woolen jumper, thin, pearl earrings, and a perfume trailed nicely behind her. Mr. Templeman will see you in a moment, she told Henry. Can I get you a coffee? No, thank you. Henry waved this aside pleasantly. It's a nice office, he said, chiefly to assure himself he was in control here. She looked around the reception area, saw the familiar large broad-leaved plants in pots strategically about the space. Yes, she said. Yes, it is. Henry went through his pre-flight checks again. Remember to enter the room, a smile just leaving the face. Extend the hand first. Stand tall. Engage the eyes. A firm, crisp, pleasant business voice. He breathed in deeply and exhaled slowly. A buzzer on the reception desk sounded, and the receptionist picked up the receiver. Yes, he said. She looked up at Henry and said, I'll take you through to Mr. Templeman now. Henry stood up, straightened his suit, and checked the knot of his tie with his fingers. He set his face in a broad smile and followed her to the room, and beyond the heavy door into the large, neat sanctum of Mr. Templeman. He heard the door click behind him as the receptionist left. Henry let the smile drain from his face. Mr. Templeman looked at him and stood up behind his desk. He looked familiar. The gold-rimmed spectacles, the high-bridged nose, an unfamiliar smile on his face, which drained away suddenly. Henry's smile had already gone. His lips were parted slightly. Mr. Templeman, he said with hesitation, extending an uncertain hand to the indignant man, a hand that had last been employed prodding the hapless Mr. Templeman in the chest that morning. Mr. Squires, said Mr. Templeman decidedly, as the occasion of their last meeting came back to him with a fury. He looked at Henry's hand and declined it. Instead, he stretched out his own towards the chair on the other side of the desk. Yes said Henry helplessly. Please, said Mr. Templeman, resuming his place behind the big, heavy desk, and sweeping his hand with unnecessary grandiloquence of gesture in the direction of the solitary, unwanted chair. Please, he said, take a seat. It had been a long day. Henry sat on the crowded train home, feeling crushed. Perhaps his condition was gentled as a result of his experience. Perhaps he was just tired. But he saw before him a thin, elderly woman, wizened and frail. She stood with bandaged legs and hands like a sparrow's feet, clutching the well-thumbed pole adjacent to his seat near the door. The diagnosis was obvious. 
Old age had caught up with a woman who had once been an object of wistful longing by a generation of young men who were now gone. There was a time when any of the men in the carriage would have been privileged to stand for her. All their eyes would have been on her. Henry watched her now. Life had defeated her. There was an impossible thread linking Henry with the old lady. None but he would see it. He hauled himself to his feet with a long sigh. Please, he said, will you have a seat? Somewhere far off, in an orderly world, where rubbers were jealously guarded and pencils kept sharpened to a perfect point, Henry saw Mr. Pleasance smiling. He had never seen him smile before. <laughs>